Let us pray. O Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your Spirit, set our hearts and minds on the source of life and peace. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Amen. We're going to switch the readings. I'm going to read the John reading. So the first reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. It's a longer reading, I know. You'll do fine. It's one story. It's hard to break up. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one will work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which the word means scent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. And others said, No, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, Yes, it's me. So they asked him, How are you now able to see? He answered, The man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, Where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man who had been born blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son, we know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said he's old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he is a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They answered him, What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? The man answered, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They answered, You were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard they expelled the man who was born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were 
with him heard what he had said and asked, Surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you wouldn't have sinned, but now you say, We see, and your sin remains. This morning's psalm reading is a very familiar one. It's the 23rd Psalm. It's a psalm by David, and it's called the Divine Shepherd. David found comfort and security in the thought that God cared for him like a shepherd cares for his sheep. We have to remember that as a boy, David was a shepherd of the sheep in his earthly father's flock. God was like a sheep to David, and David was like a sheep to God. I'm going to read this out of the Common English Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He keeps me alive, he leads me to restful waters. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full, it spills over. Yes. Goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. That may not have been as satisfying as what we're used to. Nonetheless, this morning we're going to talk about old number 23. Or, as one man I was consulting with about scripture for his mother's funeral service said, you know, can you just use that, that number 23 one? (laughs) Here in America, and probably other places, the 23rd Psalm is often read at a funeral service. It's one of the most widely known scriptures in the Bible and one of the most beloved. It's called the universal psalm, the chief psalm, the pearl of psalms. For some, the words of this psalm may be the last they ever spoke or ever heard in this earthly life. When I was a little girl with my parents in dad's hometown of Topeka, Kansas, my parents and I were walking downtown and there was a grandma looking lady standing on the street corner she had something in her hand, and as we went by, she handed me a piece of paper. It was covered front and back in this beautiful cursive writing, great penmanship. My mother did not want me to take that piece of paper from that grandma woman. But it was too late because I had already made eye contact. And I took that piece of paper And I have kept that piece of paper, and I knew that even as a young girl, I would always keep that piece of paper. Here it is. Anyways, it begins. The Psalm of Life, the 23rd Psalm. This is the only perfect poem ever written. No critic has ever found fault with it. The Lord is my shepherd protection, I shall not want, supply. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, abundance. He leadeth me beside the still waters, peace. He restoreth my soul, healing. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, guidance. For his name's sake, purpose. Either I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, experience, I fear no evil, confidence, for thou art with me, omnipresence. 
The rod and the staff, they comfort me. Instruction. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Provision. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Joy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Assurance. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eternal life. The little grandma lady had added some pieces of her own. She ended with, Seek the Lord and leave your worries with him. Do the best you can and he will do the rest. Praise the Lord. Study the Bible. I suspect by the time the grandma lady had handwritten the 23rd Psalm multiple times on papers she intended to hand out, she had the psalm pretty well committed to memory. And all over the world, the 23rd Psalm is memorized and repeated. In other parts of the world, like Asia and Africa, the 23rd Psalm is way more than a funeral reading. It carries political implications about rulers. In the ancient Near East and in Israel, kings were known as the shepherds of their people. The Old Testament book of Ezekiel tells us that the foremost responsibility of a king was to feed guide and protect their people. In other words, to provide the resources their people needed to stay alive. All the while giving special attention to those whose very existence was most threatened and those that are the most vulnerable. Unlike earthly kings who fail to provide for their people, Psalm 23 lays out what God does as our king and shepherd. It is the job of the shepherd to provide nourishment and security for the sheep. Again, all the while giving special attention to those whose existence is most threatened and those that are most vulnerable. This is how a shepherd watches over ewes that are ready to give birth and watches over the newborn lambs that they produce. I was fortunate to have gone to Australia and Wales and worked with the sheep, the ewes and the lambs. And just because those little lambs and those sheep were on different sides of the world and different hemispheres, their needs were no different. Everyone in this world is a lost sheep with basically the same needs. A newborn lamb is weak and powerless, and let me remind you, sheep in general do not have a high IQ. After the lamb is born, sometimes the lamb doesn't know it's supposed to find and suckle on its mother. And sometimes the mother doesn't know just what it was that happened or what she gave birth to, and that she was going to need to feed it. With such a lamb, you need to give it nourishment somehow. And I was usually the one in both Wales and Australia to take care of those delicate lambs. It was in Clandestine, Wales, that I lived with the Davies family on the Guadavolog farm. In Welsh, Guadavolog means two-belly farm. You see, that farm sat in a valley between two hills. There were sheep dairy cows, Rottweiler puppies, chickens, pigs, and geese. It was a really busy family farm. And I was there, it was about this time of the year during lambing season. And yes, it was often wet and chilly. And when I was there, and a wee lamb would be born, and the mother was not attentive, I would end up with that newborn lamb in my arms. It was critical to get the first milk from the mother or any ewe that had a full sack of milk without a lamb to feed. I quickly learned how to milk a ewe and fill the baby bottle up. We can have a lesson on this after church. <laughs> 
to keep the contents warm, I would place that precious bottle of first milk under my armpit and run to the farmhouse, which was heated by an old coal-burning stove in the dining room. The fragile newborn lambs lived in a box next to the so stove, and ever so gently but securely, I would pick up one of those newborn lambs, hold it in my arm like a human baby, and give it the bottle. I was doing my best to be a good shepherdess and keep that lamb alive. When we say, the Lord is my shepherd, we are acknowledging that God is our sovereign ruler, the great shepherd, our great shepherd. In doing so, we declare our commitment to God and our intention to live under God's reign. We are also acknowledging that Jesus Christ became the gracious host who not only prepares a table for us, feeds us, reconciles enemies, but also offers us abundant life. We often forget that to be a sheep of the Lord is to have everything we need, I shall not want. And to have everything we need is not because you or I or anyone else has worked for it, earned it, or acquired it, but it's because God provides it. I shall not want, I lack nothing. As I think back a few weeks ago to the earthquake that rattled Turkey and Syria, and I think about those people that survived who were under the rubble for hours, days, even a week, and they lived. And I keep thinking, what kept them going? Perhaps they thought of a loved one. Perhaps they prayed. Perhaps they recited scripture. Perhaps they knew they were not alone. Perhaps they knew the good shepherd was there with them, walking through the deepest, darkest valley. And although these people were mostly Muslim, they know about the Psalms. And they knew the Good Shepherd was there with them. Just like when we walk through the deepest, darkest valleys, the Good Shepherd is leading us, is there with us. The Psalm ends, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just like two sheepdogs at the rear of the herd, goodness and mercy follow us in this earthly life and into the next. But wait, it gets even better. The Hebrew word is a verb. I'm going to take a crack at it. Arlen, don't listen too carefully, or Jason. It's a Hebrew word like lara diff. I'm not sure what it really is, but just keep that in mind. There is such a word. And it's a much more active verb than follow. It means to pursue. How cool is that? Goodness and mercy do far more than follow us. They pursue us. They chase us. They want us. Like God is in active pursuit of us. God wants us to be living our best life. And how can we go wrong if everything we need is provided by the Good Shepherd and goodness and mercy shall pursue us all the days of our life in this life and the life to come? Amen. Now, sheep, as your lights are blazing, Go peacefully, looking upon the hearts of others. Live in Christ's light, even in the darkest valley. Trust that the Good Shepherd is able to open your eyes, enabling you to walk by faith. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.